many, many things are vital to our living and to our standard of living. Only one, but a big one, is steel. We could do without it, but not as well, because it does a lot of things for us. Try naming them sometime. You'll find it hard to stop. The steel mills are amazing complexes, dependent upon mountains and mines of iron ore, high-grade coke baked from bituminous coal, limestone, a common stone, but as costly as any to transport and utilize. Making good steel isn't easy. It takes the best materials, the best machinery, the best men, men at the blast furnace, the open hearth furnace, men of science, men in the rolling mill, men at the electric arc furnace, men who are proud to be called steel men. It takes raw materials from all over the world to make steel. This iron ore may have come from any one of 10 states or distant mines in other countries. The first step in producing steel is to make iron in the blast furnace. The raw materials are taken to the top of the furnace in skip cars. Loaded at the bottom of the furnace, this car carries raw iron ore. Sometimes the ore is centered or pelletized to facilitate blast furnace operation. This skip car carries coke. Coke produced from coal that may have been mined in any one of 19 states. The next car carries limestone that may have been quarried in Alabama, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or Utah. Or coke limestone. Charging a blast furnace that can produce more than 3,000 tons of molten iron every 24 hours. Within the furnace, an inferno rages, a man-controlled inferno of chemical reactions. In diagrammatic animation, we see blasts of hot air raise the temperature of burning coke to 3,600 degrees, thereby supplying the heat required for the chemical reactions to take place. Carbon dioxide is produced and reacts with the excess carbon present to produce carbon monoxide gas that is carried up the furnace. Near the top of the furnace, the temperature is only 700 degrees Fahrenheit. As the burden settles downward and the temperature increases greatly, the lime from the limestone combines with impurities from the ore in the coke and carries them to the bottom of the furnace as slag. The slag and molten metal collect in the hearth of the furnace. The lighter slag on top, the heavier iron underneath. Every few hours, the slag is drawn off through the slag notch. Several times a day, the molten iron is cast from a separate opening. Four hundred tons of white-hot iron at a time for this furnace. gushing stream of iron runs into an insulated transfer car where it is kept molten. Transfer cars move the molten iron from the blast furnace to the steel making furnaces where the iron is changed into steel. Here the transfer car tips to pour the liquid metal into a ladle which will carry the hot iron to the open hearth furnace. The open hearth furnace is a versatile tool for steel production. Before the furnace is ready for the molten iron, a charging machine loads the furnace with limestone, iron ore, and steel scrap. Scrap comes from old automobiles, machinery, railroad cars, steel rails, and other pieces of iron and steel that have outlived their usefulness. The ladle of molten iron from the blast furnace is added after the limestone, iron ore, and scrap. Scientific controls help the melter meet the most exacting specifications. To get a better look at what happens inside the open hearth, 
Let's diagram it with the top off. We see that the molten mixture is held in an oblong shallow hearth. Burners at each end of the furnace alternately send long tongues of flame across the surface of the mixture. The searing flames raise the temperature of the charge to about 3,000 degrees. And chemical reactions take place that change iron to steel. The appearance of the slag on a heat of steel is important to the melter. There's no substitute for experience. It takes a real pro with all the help he can get from scientific instruments to judge when the chemical reactions have gone far enough to give the steel the exact composition required. By this time, the melter has a lab report which he checks against the production order. This heat meets specifications. A pyrometer gives him further information measuring temperatures far beyond the range of an ordinary thermometer. That cable hanging from the back of the handle runs directly to the control panel. With only a glance, the melter has to be able to read and interpret the recordings of precise instruments. Instruments that tell him what he needs to know. With a signal to his crew, the melter goes to the tapping side of the furnace. That whistle says, be alert. The tapping hole is located at the rear of the open hearth furnace. The man places the shaped charge that will blow out the refractory plug and release the white hot steel. The wire from the charge is connected to the battery. watches the steel carefully to be ready to add the alloys that are specified for this particular heat. Carbon steel can be changed to make steels for special purposes by the addition of such elements as chromium or nickel. Introduction of oxygen by lance improved the efficiency of open hearth production to a significant degree but its most efficient application is developed today in the basic oxygen process. A basic oxygen shop can turn out high quality steel much faster than open hearth furnaces. Molten iron is charged into the basic oxygen furnace, followed by scrap dropped into the mouth of the vessel. In the basic oxygen process, the chemical and physical reactions take place very quickly. After about 20 minutes, the nature of the flames, confirmed by computer calculations, indicate that the reaction is complete and the furnace is ready to pour. Another important tool of steel making is the electric arc furnace. This is used to make stainless and many other special steels. Scrap is its basic diet. After the furnace top is moved aside and the furnace is charged with scrap, an operator uses fingertip controls to direct powerful machinery that slides the huge top back into place. When the current is turned on, the power surging to the electrode sways the heavy cables. In fact, you could light a fair-sized city with the electricity used in a single electric arc furnace. 
here, too, the melter is the master chef, who controls the recipe for the special steel he's making. Carefully measured amounts of nickel, chromium, tungsten, vanadium, or other alloys are added to give each customer precisely the kind of special steel he needs. The charging machine adds limestone and other materials to remove impurities. is ready to tap, the melter goes to the pouring side. He pushes a lever, and the whole furnace tilts to pour the steel into the waiting ladle. Whether the steel flows from electric furnace, BOF, or open hearth, it moves next to the teeming area. But this is only the beginning, for different steels acquire still more varied qualities in the treating and shaping yet to come. Here, steel from an open hearth furnace is poured into waiting cast iron molds. Then the ingot molds are moved to the stripping stand. Here, huge hooks remove the mold from the ingot. The ingot is still hot, but solid enough to hold its shape. Next stop is at the large furnaces called soaking pits, where the ingots are brought to uniform high temperature for rolling. When the rolling mill calls for steel, the ingot is ready. 2300 degrees hot, top to bottom, inside and out. In these operations, ingots generally range from four and one half to 24 tons. That's from 9,000 to 48,000 pounds. Ingots are rolled into a bloom or a slab. Blooms give the world structural steel. Structural steel for skyscrapers, bridges, and other structures. Blooms are also rolled into billets, another common shape of semi-finished steel. Billets are formed into tubes and bars of many shapes and sizes, from which manufacturers make drills, hand tools, and hardware. Billets to make rods, rods to make wire, steel wire for baskets, paper clips, coat hangers, fences, window screen, and countless other things. Slabs from ingots can be rolled into plate. Plates may be used in the strong hull of an atomic-powered ship. Storage tanks, a giant crane, road building equipment, or heavy machinery. Conventional processing now goes to work on the ingot. Skilled men manipulate the mechanical monsters that shape and form the ingot into slabs. Some slabs continue on their way immediately. 
Other slabs are kept in storage until they are needed. Before being further rolled, these slabs must be reheated to the proper rolling temperature in the reheat furnace. When the slab reaches 2300 degrees, out it comes, headed for the scale breaker. Then it continues through the roughing stands. The slab is squeezed, flattened, and edged as it passes through one set of rollers after another. The slab that was once seven inches thick and 12 or 15 feet long now is a sheet of steel over a quarter of a mile long and only one sixteenth of an inch thick. Traveling about 20 to 25 miles an hour, the sheet races down the runout table where water sprays drench the steel with 1,000 gallons a minute to cool it to proper coiling temperature. The steel at this stage is known as hot rolled, for which there are a variety of uses. However, most steel is processed further. It may be pickled to remove oxide. It may be cold reduced, annealed, temper rolled, galvanized, or coated with tin. More and more, a cold rolled sheet, as seen here, is being shipped to customers in huge coils. Customers stockpile coils right in their own plants to have a supply of steel on hand when they need it. Steel like this, but with many technical variations according to the needs of customers, continues now in every direction to lend beauty and style and strength to automobiles. to provide tough steel that will stretch without breaking and form the wash tub of a washing machine. To make billions of cans each year to bring us beverages, food, and countless other products. To give polish and durability to kitchen cabinets and appliances, or to form the clean and colorful surfaces for the buildings of today and tomorrow. No other metal, perhaps no other material, is as versatile as steel, and yet it is not easily produced. The investment of many thousands of share owners is required to build and keep modern the mills. The imagination and patient continuing research of many trained minds is essential to the development of new and improved products and methods. But above all, steel challenges and attracts the dedication of thousands of men, proud to be called steel men, proud of their contribution to a world in which the progress of man is so closely associated with the progress of steel.